Welcome to Environmental Construction Specifications 101. Uh, this is a presentation I've done before in a longer format. I thought uh, I put together just a short, quick overview. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or anything, please post them in the chat. Questions, I'll, uh, if I can, I'll address during the presentation, but most likely it'll be at, most likely it will be at the end. Um, and if if we're having technical difficulties, uh, I just learned something about. Zoom here that I didn't know before. So I think I've got everything set up right. But uh, let me know if there's any issues here. Okay, let's get started. This presentation is being put on by the Pacific Northwest chapter of the International Erosion Control Association. Um, this is our website and email, and I will post the email on chat later in the presentation. I want to thank our sponsors for making these webinars possible. So far, we've done, I think, one a, one a month for almost two years now. Uh, so again, I'm serious. If anybody is interested in uh, presenting, uh, just send me, drop me an email or put your information in the chat. I'm uh, your presenter today. I'm Dave Jenkins. I'm a certified professional erosion sediment control. I'm also retired. Uh, so why am I doing this? Well, it's keeping me out of trouble with uh, my wife. Um, I have 30 years of heavy civil and cons uh, infrastructure construction, public works, 27 at the Port of Seattle, and three at Department of Transportation, all of it in erosion control, stormwater, and environmental, mainly cleanups. Learning objectives today are to um, compare contracts or contract language and permit language, um, get some ideas on how to translate the permit language into contract language, why it's important. Oops, sorry. And also how to review specs and how to inspect um, using the specs, inspect a project. A couple of de definitions before we get into it here. Um, a contract is a binding agreement between two or more persons that is legally enforceable. Uh, permit is an official document giving someone authorization to do something. For example, um, a uh, authorization to discharge construction stormwater. And then the specifications are the details that specify the materials installation uh, information required to actually build what it is that you want to build. One thing I learned early on in my career is uh, there's two ways to, there's probably more, but there's two ways to look at specifications. Um, you can look at them as black and white. This is the word, this is the Bible, that's it. This is what it says. Um, or you can use them as a guide uh, or something in between. So I learned early on uh, and my method is to use them probably more often as a guide than a Bible. Um, only because, and especially because environmental uh, projects or environmental uh, components of a project is so much a gray area. Um, so no, ma no matter how well you write a spec for an environmental situation, um, you're probably going to have to change it once you get out in the field. So um, I, I use it both ways, and I'll go into that a little bit more. The other uh, issue is that specs are written in blood. This was also beat into me early on. Uh, no matter how well you write a contract spec, you're going to find out very quickly how well it's written uh, once it gets put in a contract. Um, there'll be deficiencies, and you'll change it. You'll change your spec for the next contract. Happens all the time. Okay, what's the main difference between permits and contracts? Uh, permits, in this case, I'm using the Washington State Construction Stormwater General Permit. It covers the entire state of Washington, covers all project types. It's very general. Um, yeah, it's very general. Contract project specs are very specific, hence the name. Um, and they need to be because they deal with one particular project, one particular situation. So I'll give you an example of the difference here that I wrote up. Um, say your child wants to borrow the car 
And uh, there's two ways you can do this. And, and actually, uh, I'm kind of more the permit person than the contract person when it comes to that. But if you issued your child a permit to use the car, you might say something like this. You are hereby permitted to use the car. Permittee should, permittee should be home by 10 p.m. to avoid possible penalties. Permittee shall return car with a full tank of gas if practicable. And permittee should call parent to report lateness, empty gas tank, um, or, I can't read this, or impairment. So these are all um, permit words in red. So you will see this and you can read any permit and you'll see these words. Now, here's what that would look like in a contract. Child may use the car tonight. The child shall be home by 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So biddable, it's uh, not biddable. Um, it is specific. It's measurable. Uh, there's no ambiguity here. And if I was writing this for a contractor, it's also biddable. They know exactly what's required. Uh, upon return of the car, the gas tank shall be full as measured by the gas gauge. Again, measurable. Uh, child shall pay for all tickets, et cetera, et cetera. If for any reason child thinks they may, home, may be home after 10 p.m., child shall call the parent immediately and before 9.30 uh, with a satisfactory reason. Um, if for re any reason the child is unable to drive home, such as impairment, child shall immediately call a parent at above number to be picked up. Child will park a suitable distance away, not to embarrass them, and will not punish the child. Uh, want to encourage good behavior like, okay, you maybe are impaired. I don't want you driving. So anyway, that's, that's the idea. It's all measurable. Uh, everybody's clear on it. Uh, it's up to you whether you want to hold the child exactly black and white as the Bible, or if you want to uh, give them some flexibility. So Excuse me while I let somebody in from the waiting room. So here's the secret you've all been uh, hoping for. You need to read the permit, understand what it requires and who it requires it of, um, and translate it into contract language. Something else you'll notice about permits, it's kind of written for everybody. There's things in there that are written for the designer there's things for the contractor, um, there's several audiences. And if you put that into a contract that only deals with the contractor, it gets confusing. Okay, so contract language 101 here. First one is your Latin lesson, uh, contra proferentum, I think I'm saying that right, which means against the offerer. And this is a contract law concept goes way back, I think, into probably English common law. Um, and that is what it means is the person writing and offering the contract for bid, um, if there's confusion or ambiguity, and there's a dispute, then the mediator, judge, or whoever is deciding will most likely lean toward the contractor, not the owner. So um, it really behooves the owner to write very clear specs. Another uh, aspect of that is reasonable interpretation. Again, if there's a, a, a dispute or argument and you go to a judge, um, they will use the reasonable interpretation argument and, uh, and decide, okay, what would a reasonable person on the street think of this language? How would they interpret it? Uh, there's also an order of precedence. So in a contract, there's lots of different uh, components of it. The specifications and plans are only two components of many. Uh, there could be a dozen different ones in, in order of precedence. So again, if there's confusion or dispute, um, in this case, I really simplified this, but the specifications, uh, from my experience, always precede the plans. So if there's confusion between the two, the speci specifications went out. Um, and then same with the other documents, and that would be any permits or other environmental documents that you include in a contract, maybe as reference. Uh, the specifications proceed or take precedence over those. Contract words. Contractor always shall do something, or in the case of, I see this more and more, federal contracts, they say must rather than shall. Contractor shall do something. 
in this case, contractor shall crush concrete and use it as base course. And then in this case, the owner will, the owner always will do something. Owner doesn't shall, the owner doesn't must, the owner will, wills. So in this case, the owner will work with the FAA to make sure that jet traffic uh, is not impaired by construction. Don't uh, ever use should in a contract. Um, it's an ambiguous word. I do see this a lot in environmental specs. Contractor should stop erosion immediately upon observation, which is a really good idea, and the contractor should do that, but it, they technically don't have to uh, in a contract if you put this in a contract. So, you know, avoid that. If you want the contractor to stop erosion immediately upon observation, uh, say it, contractor shall. Uh, you can use the word may occasionally, be very careful with it. Uh, this particular project was a contaminated site, uh, two components, one on the left side of a highway, one on the right. Uh, the right side was the bulk of the work and we specified a construction stormwater treatment system for all that water. And then we set on the plan sheets, the existing storm pipe under the highway may be slip lined and used to convey water across the roadway so that the contractor wouldn't have to have a treatment system on the left side. Uh, unfortunately, and for many reasons, it wasn't possible, uh, but we gave the contractor the option. So when it was decided, determined that you couldn't slip line, contractor said, okay, what do you want me to do with all the water on the left side? The port owns that, or the, the uh, contract owner owns that problem now, because we said, said may. Uh, we ended up paying, I think, $100,000 for another treatment system on the left side of the project. So can't stress enough, be careful using that word. Some more do's and don'ts. Um, if the contract's not clear, even if you don't get a dispute, or you add stuff, you think of stuff after contract award, uh, any, any change is going to essentially, or in most cases, be a change order, and you're going to pay for it. Uh, I found this on the internet, and actually there's a big earthwork contractor in Seattle that has this. Uh, this isn't his, but he has one down in Des Moines uh, Marina, south of Seattle. And his little tender is base contract, and then his yacht is change order. So uh, it's, you know, it's humorous, and it's un it, it seems unfortunate, but contractor has to bid low enough, reasonably low enough to be able to get a contract. Um, and knowing that there's going to be changes, you know, change conditions, weather changes, uh, the owner wants something different, whatever. A personal issue for me is uh, putting specs on plan sheets. It adds confusion. You don't know if the designer just pulled out a CAD file from another project and stuck it in. Uh, you don't know if it compares to the environmental specs that are actually in the spec book. Um, it's just to me is a bad idea. I've seen it cause more problems than it's worth. Uh, unless a project is really small and it makes sense to put everything on plan sheets, which is the case in some projects, or you do exactly the same type of work all the time, uh, I would avoid this. Just use the specs in the spec book. And then recycling, you have to be really careful. So I used to do this all the time. I think most people do. Uh, you have a spec that worked in a project, it was well-written, went well, and you have another project that you have to use that spec in. You pull it over from the previous project, saves you a lot of time. But just be careful um, because the new project is going to have differences and you're going to have to modify that spec. Uh, you, so you can't pull it over just straight over and use it as is. Uh, this I see in environmental specs all the time, uh, repeating. So don't repeat, just say it once. Uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't repeat, say it once. Uh, it doesn't add importance or, um, or a level of, uh, well, a level of importance to the contractor by saying the same thing more than once. And with that, be concise in specs. This is taken from a cleanup project and it talks about the EPA Superfund offsite disposal rule. Uh, it's important, uh, but for the contractor, this is what it actually means. They're gonna get 
maybe that far, and then it's just words. Um, it's not a biddable thing. It's really written for the person putting the contract together. They're going to have to decide where the, uh, this contaminated soil is going to go and get it approved by EPA before they put the contract out. So this is something that is not necessary. And so in a contract, it should just be removed. That's real concise. Another one, uh, environmental, is it's possible that there'll be disturbance of Native American materials. Contractor uh, shall send people to a little class and uh, to talk about that very thing. So this is what that actually looks like. Uh, the first in blue um, is important information. The second one uh, is important only to the contractor for their their bidding purposes. They'll know they'll have to send eight or 10 people to a one hour class. And what's that gonna cost? Well, will that, will that impact the schedule? Things like that. Hello, Adam. Um, and then the last part is something. So the blue and the green are things that the archeologist should talk about in this one hour orientation. They doesn't need to be in the spec. And there's what it looks like. Um, I crossed off at a minimum. I didn't really need to, and I couldn't figure out how to uncross it. So I left it in. So I'll, I'll just read it. At a minimum, vegetable oil or biodegradable oil should be used in hydraulic lines, et cetera. And then it, the purpose is to minimize potential impacts. Contractor doesn't need to know that. If you want them to know that, then put in the contract that the contractor shall attend an environmental awareness course before work begins and uh, tell them this and tell them the archeological stuff. All they need to know is they have to use biodegradable oil in their equipment. And that helps them in bidding. They can, you know, if they, if they uh, rent equipment, some rental companies don't allow this. So they'll have to choose somebody else or, or they'll charge more. Um, so contractor will know that. Um, or if they have to change their own, it takes time. Uh, time and money, so they can figure that into their uh, budget and schedule. Um, landscape stuff, I see this all the time. I should say, I saw this all the time since I'm retired. So trees and shrubs shall be watered by the contractor as needed to keep them in healthy growth, parentheses for trees, seven gallons, et cetera. And the contractor reads this as they're putting their bid together and all it says to the contractor is, uh, there's going to be trees, and they need to be watered, and they need to be healthy. And that's it. They can't bid that. Uh, what they can bid, so you want, as an owner, uh, the, this is really an issue in the dry months. So between June 1st and August 31st, each tree shall receive seven gallons, and each shrub shall receive three gallons of water weekly. That's biddable. So the contractor can figure, let's say, 1,000 trees, 1,000 shrubs times how many gallons a week, times how many weeks. Uh, it's over 100,000 gallons. They can say, okay, uh, let's see, is there a hydrant nearby? That might even be a question, a bidder question when this thing is uh, being bid out. Uh, is there water available? Also, the contractor is probably going to sub this out to a landscaper. So they need to, uh, the landscaper needs to prepare a bid. They need to know this information. They, they don't need to know there's trees and that they need to be watered. They need to know exactly how many trees, how much water, and when. Okay, so that's contract. Let's talk permit. Um, and, and I say generally because it's, you know nothing's 100%, but pretty much 100% of the time, you can't insert permit language into a contract as is and expect compliance. And I'm glad you asked why. Um, these are things taken from the construction stormwater general permit, maximum degree practicable, if possible, to minimize as needed, if necessary, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, none of these are contract or biddable words or enforceable words, really. So I'll take one specific item from the permit, stabilize access points with a pad of quarries balls, crushed rock, or other equivalent BMPs. That's good information to minimize tracking sediment on the roads. Um, before I move on and talk about minimize, 
Uh, if we've all worked construction for any length of time, we should all know that quarry spalls and crushed rock don't really do much for sediment track out. I suppose they minimize, but if tires are going onto a rock pad, um, they're going to go off dirty. Now let's talk about minimize. What does it mean? One person's minimize is uh, different than another person's minimize. So does it mean no track out? Does it mean uh, no clumps? You know, is is the track out on the left with the clumps, is that bad? Is the track out on the right kind of okay? If they remove the clumps, is that minimized? Uh, concrete, same, same thing, next to a catch basin that's open, unfortunately. So different situations here. Um, what, what is your expectation? What is the regulator's expectation of this? Now I'm gonna go into examples and I'll talk about the minimize a little bit more. This is how contractor minimized erosion on a very large runway project. Um, I think 400, 500, 600 acres. It's 120 foot long tire wash, about 10 tire rotations. A contractor constructed this to meet the spec. So sediment track out, this is this, the Port of Seattle spec. At no time shall mud debris or visible sediment be allowed outside the project boundaries and on any port owned and public roads. Uh, this is possible. The port's been doing it for years. Um, and the reason the port set it up this way is when they did that big project where you had trucks running 20 hours a day, six days a week, uh, sometimes one a minute coming out of the site into the tire wash, um, just a little bit on each tire, 18 tires times how many trucks is a lot of stuff on the road. So we had to set a standard. This is the Bible part, no visible. Um, we did offer some flexibility because of the tire wash and other things that we're, the contractor was doing. And also we can't have crap out on the uh, runways to get sucked into jet engines. So this was critical at the port. Uh, this is how I inspected actually a lot of times if I was having trouble and not getting a uh, contractor to make changes, I just get a piece of paper or a paper towel and either wipe a tire or the road surface and ask them if they thought that was clean and ask them if that they think that met spec. That was very effective, actually. Um, here's another possible. Uh, this is from a contaminated site where a tire wash system was required. So a tire wash system has met the performance criteria when there is no mud at the paved or stabilized exit of the system. And uh, tires and undercarriage are visibly clean. So this is it's another uh, example of biddable and enforceable, you know, you as an inspector looking at the specs and you see this, and then you look at a truck, there's no ambiguity here. Uh, this is one I added. This is the written in blood portion. Um, I had a spec for sweepers that said something about uh, sweepers need to, sweepers shall uh, function according to manufacturer's requirements, I think it was. And this kept happening. So when the drivers would dump their hoppers, they wouldn't clean the seals around the door and stuff would build up and then they would leak. So they're picking up muddy water and sediment and then it's going right out the back. So I added this uh, in no time show hopper gaskets, leak debris and liquid. Um, this was real quick. I'd probably say it different differently now, but um, it had the proper effect. A couple of projects here. Um, this is a tidal riverbank habitat restoration project on the Duwamish River south of Seattle. And uh, let's see, well, I've got this picture up. Where the logs are sticking out of the bank, that elevation is about plus 12, or that's a pretty typical high tide uh, marker. And where the water is at this moment is plus eight. And uh, yeah, plus eight. So Tide's going up and down all the time. In summertime, when, when this work was done, uh, the low tide could go as low as minus three. So a lot of bare mud exposed. Now we didn't want the contractor and weren't allowed to have the contractor working in the water. So the designer came up with a spec that specified how the work needed to be done. Um, contractor had to maintain a two foot vertical 
elevation or six foot horizontal separation at all times between tide level and any work activity. So let me go back to this one. So again, the logs are at plus 12, the water is at plus eight. So that is in this case, a four foot vertical separation and uh, anywhere from a 10 to 20 foot horizontal separation. Um, this tells a contractor when they're reading this to prepare a bid, okay, I'm gonna have to work from the top down and then back out as the tide's coming back in and be stabilized. So they would have to work sections basically uh, at a time. Uh, this one comes up on seaport projects occasionally every few years, uh, a building demo needs to happen. And uh, best time to do that, of course, is spring and summer, which happens to be the best time for seagulls to nest on roofs. Uh, and I was surprised to learn that seagulls are covered under the Federal Migratory Bird Act. So this held up a number of projects over the years waiting for the nesting season to end uh, because there wasn't the planning ahead. So I eventually wrote a spec for this reading, I don't know, eight or 10 pages of Migratory Bird Act language and turn it into a spec. So um, I'll just cover part of them. So owner will provide bird watch services up to 30 days after contract execution, which gives the contractor time to line somebody up to do this. Beginning uh, 30 days after execution, contractors shall take full responsibility. Uh, contractor shall be responsible for preventing migratory birds from nesting, uh, nests that do not contain eggs, and are not in the possession of migratory birds shall be destroyed. Uh, and that's allowed under the act. Nests that contain one or more eggs shall not be disturbed and immediately be reported to the engineer. Uh, nests that are complete and in the possession of a migratory bird with or without eggs shall, uh, shall not be disturbed and reported. And then all associated delay costs or anything associated with this, uh, contractor assumes all responsibility. So very clear, contractor knows what they need to do, how long they're gonna have to do it, um, whether they're gonna need more than one person or not, um, all those sorts of things. And then I'm gonna close out the projects with a cut and fill project. Um, this is taken from the Construction Stormwater General Permit. Permittee must design and construct cut and fill slopes in a manner to minimize erosion. So what does that mean? They do provide a little guidance here, which is good. Um, but permitting must design and construct. Well, that's two different functions. The owner designs and the contractor constructs. So this is written for two audiences, as I, I mentioned earlier. Um, so that adds some confusion if you put this in a contract. And then the designer is going to take this. They're going to design the slope the way they need to. So they're going to translate that language. Um, that means we need to break up the slope, we need to roughen it, we need to cover it with something um, all to prevent erosion. Um, and okay, so that's our translation. Sorry, I just let somebody in. And this is the specification. Con uh, contractor shall track walk and hydroseed slopes when 30 feet vertical fill has been placed. Minimum 10 foot wide benches shall be placed at each lift with positive drainage away from the face and a soil berm maintained on the top of the fill slope at all times. This is what it looks like in the plans. So each lift is 30 feet, uh, each bench 10 feet, typical, sloped away, and then you see the berm up at the top. This is what it looks like in real life. And this is the berm at the top. So with that, um, we'll go into questions, comments, concerns, and if you want to put it in, put them in chat, go ahead. If you want to unmute, I think you can unmute yourselves. Uh, go ahead and do that. If you think of something after the fact, you know, any questions, comments, concerns, uh, you want to volunteer to do a webinar, uh, you can contact us at pnwieca.info at gmail.com. Okay, looks like 
Look, I have a question. Um, you're welcome, Jeff. Thank you for, I uh, hope you appreciate it. Thank you for your appreciation. Um, so a question, if you all require proprietary products, how do you write that? How do you write that in specifications? Okay, well, two things. My my background is public works. So if you want a pr proprietary project, you have to go through a justification process. You can't just specify something by name or write the spec so there's only one possible solution for it um, without going through it's a sole source process. You can do it. Um, you would end up after the justification writing, just writing a typical spec. So I, I have some examples here. And if you guys want to stay on, I'll go through some more examples. Uh, let me jump ahead and see if I can find the spec I'm talking about. And I can't, I don't have it. Um, so what you would do, the spec I wrote was for straw waddles. Um, so what you would do is you would write, say, length and diameter. Uh, of the straw waddle, what material you want. So you want straw, you want biodegradable, whatever. So that's part of it. You would have some kind of uh, installation requirement in there. And in in the case, in, in our experience, we also say uh, straw waddle shall not be used on impervious surface. So if you, if you don't have to go through the sole source, pro sole source process, and you can just uh, spec anything you want. A lot of manufacturers have written specs for their material. And a lot of times you can pull those in, you know, straight into your contract um, or just name something. So I don't know, Barney, if that answers your question. Uh, and Adam, have you ever, no, I have not specified the size or uh, the type, yes. Uh, I haven't specified horsepower or any of that. Uh, we do always require vacuum sweepers, fully functional vacuum sweepers, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we don't allow broom sweepers. We don't allow power brooms, you know, the little rotate counter rotating brooms with uh, that any laborer can drive. Uh, we don't allow those, but always a vacuum sweeper. Um, I suppose, you know, especially private construction, you could say which sweeper you want, you want to use specifically. So I don't know if that, that helps out, Adam. Um, we have a lot of sweeper services around Puget Sound. So, um, you know, we, we always, if we say we want to, you know, 100% vacuum, uh, we'll get one. Any other questions? Okay, um, I'm going to keep going. I know this was a 30 minute, but most of you are staying on. So I'm going to take that as a sign that I can keep going. And these are just various specs that I've pulled out of contracts. And um, you can, based on what we've been talking about, you can read them real quick and you can decide, is this something that should be in a contract? Should it be written a different way? Um, things like that. So this is all good information in this spec. Oh, please keep going. All right. Agree. Appreciate it. Um, and you have to be careful. I'll just, this this uh, shy reserved kid from Southern California will keep talking about this because I get passionate about this stuff. Um, yeah, so this is all good information. Um, it's, I suppose it's biddable if somebody really knows what this all means. Um, I think it, it should be tighter. And certainly you don't want to say where practicable. If if you want it, say it. This is what we want. Should seeded areas areas fail to germinate, contractors shall rework, refertilize water, recede as described until germination is effected at no cost to the port. It's a decent spec, except it should it should describe what adequate germination is. And we actually do, or uh, we have written. I'll probably always say we, meaning the port. Um, we actually have, I think, 85 or 90% cover is required. That That is adequate germination. So this, this is not a bad spec. 
This one is puzzling. Install stockpile cover in a manner that minimizes wrinkles and provides for a straight placement. Uh, this was on a contaminated site, but I never figured out why this really is important. Um, I mean, you just cover the stockpile. You don't want to have holes or gaps in the seams because you don't want stuff running off. But I certainly wouldn't go to a contractor and say, I see wrinkles, you need to fix them. Um, emission reduction, use electrical power where possible for activities such as for water treatment and operation of support facilities. Um, contract wise, it, it's, you know, it's when a contractor is uh, bidding a contract, are they going to know whether electrical power is available? Maybe, maybe not. So the owner really would have to say, in the contract, electrical service is available. Contractor shall provide all hookups, uh, permitting to do the hookups and all associated activity, uh, something like that. So they they know what to bid. Um, or hey, it's not available. Uh, diesel generators, and then the uh, the contract writer can decide. Okay, is the contractor going to pay for consumables? Are we going to pay for consumables? Uh, that sort of stuff. So this in itself is is not a good spec. It's good information, but not done well. All hazardous materials and waste containers shall be stored with the container lid secured. Um, yep, I would go with that. No stockpiling staging materials shall occur below the mean higher high water mark of any water body. So mean higher high water mark is a is a, actually a legal definition. Um, you might you might want to put the actual elevation in here, uh, but this i think this is probably good enough as is. this was used on that habitat restoration project by the way i love this one portions of this contract are very unique and are under strict control of several regulatory agencies well that pretty much describes every project uh it is understood that this work is so designed and these contract requirements are so stated that the materials and equipment specified are required for the abatement project and the final function of the facility. Uh, you know, this always leaves me speechless. I, I, I don't know what, I don't know why. I don't know why this is put in a contract. So, you know, if it's a abatement project or something like that, you know, what, what are you abating? I, I assume they have a, con, a, a specification in there that tells what they want and how they want it. But um, I, I just don't understand this one. And you guys, you know, if if you do understand some of these things and want to explain it to me, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, contractor is encouraged to use biodiesel fuel in construction equipment and vehicles operating on the project site. Contractor is encouraged. Um, I don't know any contractor that would be encouraged to do this if they didn't have to. Um, so does not belong in the contract. If you want biodiesel fuel used in the contract, then again, spec it. Uh, fueling shall not take place within 100 feet of any natural or man-made drainage conveyance, including ditches, catch basins, ponds, wetlands, and pipes. I think that's pretty clear. Um, I actually wrote that, so I think it's a great spec. And that's all I have. Um, any final questions, comments, uh, volunteers? I know one of you wants to do a, a webinar. I, I need somebody for February. So uh, just get back to me. Again, info at gmail.com. Oh, before you guys go, uh, this does qualify for 0.5 professional development hours. So us, send me your contact information or put it in the chat real quick and I'll get you a certificate. I always forget that part. So I'll hang on here for a minute if you guys need time. Hey, Angela, I'll get one to you. Uh, does ECI, what is ECI? Uh, EnviroCert International the uh, group that does CPESE and CESWI. 
Um, as far as I know, they do. I've submitted them. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah I thought I'd heard they were they weren't going to accept a half hour or less anymore, but uh, I may have been wrong. I just thought you might know. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, Barney got yours. Uh, going once, going twice. Uh, thank you all for your interest and uh, attention on this. Uh, this is one of my passionate subjects I'd love to talk about because it's been bugging me for so many years. And I uh, hope you all got at least a little bit out of it that will help you on your projects. While I'm enjoying retirement, often going off in the sunset and you guys are working. So, okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out. And uh, you guys take care and have a good, good day, rest of the day. Thanks. Bye-bye.